When Primitive Man first attached wheels to a bit of wood and used the resulting contraption to careen dangerously down a nearby hill, little did he know the world-changing craze that he had created. Anthony Frank Hawk, better known as Tony Hawk and respectfully known by his many admirers as Birdman, is arguably the most famous modern proponent of Roly Planky, or skateboarding as it would come to be known, and his recognisability to gamers of a certain era is comparable to that of Lara Croft, Crash Bandicoot, and maybe even Mario himself. The Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series exploded onto the scene in probably quite a gnarly sort of way in 1999, to a stellar critical reception and and enviable commercial success, and the series instantly ollied its way into the hearts of the collective gaming public. That said, it's definitely had its share of ups and downs, and some might argue that the Tony Hawk franchise seems to consist mostly of a gradual downslope without the customary bit that goes back up at the end. More of an uninterrupted descending ramp than a halfpipe. We'll expand on all that in good time though, because for this video we've looked at each game in the series, assessed their stunts, tricks and spills, and taken into account their critical reception at the time of release and their current status with nostalgic fans. As usual, we won't be looking at remakes, re-releases, collections, or mobile games, with each game being judged solely on its original incarnation, so a quick hello to the excellent Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 remakes, as we won't be talking about you today. I hope you're well, though. We may also split handheld versions off into their own entry if they're deemed different enough from their console and PC-based siblings. Right, that's enough official stuff, it's time to get this thing rolling. Prepare for more alley-oops, fakies, drop-ins, and nose grabs than he can shake a specifically designed 7 to 8 ply maple plywood deck with polyurethane wheels at as we thrash around the vast, varied and exciting skate park that is the Tony Hawk series. Let's rank em. I'm Ben. And I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and here is every Tony Hawk video game ranked from worst to best. Number 19. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, PS3, PS4, Xbox 360, and Xbox One. 2015. After original Tony Hawk developers Neversoft departed the series to make the Guitar Hero games, Chicago-based developer Robomodo stepped in. This now-defunct studio's final game, and at the time of recording, the final original release in the Tony Hawk franchise was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. This ill-fated title was intended to be a return to form for an ailing series and a return to its roots, even going so far as to revive the original Pro Skater name that hadn't been seen since 2002. It was an idea that was nice in theory, but in reality Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5's development and release turned into a bit of a horror story and resulted in a game that finds itself in a crumpled bloody mess right at the bottom of our list. Eschewing the story modes that had started to appear in mid-era Tony Hawk's games, Pro Skater 5 offered no-frills, score-based, open-ended gameplay, with the player's goal being to flip and trick their way to the top of the scoreboard or collect certain items depending on the game mode. This was achieved across ten skate park maps, with players also able to create their own skate parks to thrash around in as well. Not that they'd want to, however. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 received a sound and unanimous critical mauling, with its dodgy controls and mechanics, repetitive challenges, ropey visuals, and plethora of bugs and glitches all failing to escape the notice of merciless reviewers. Rushed to release due to an impending license expiry, the game came out in an incomplete state, with players requiring an 8 gigabyte day one patch to access most of the game's content. As you're no doubt aware, this sort of thing doesn't go down too well with the gaming public, and Pro Skater 5 was rightfully panned. Seen as an insult to the series and to skateboarding culture as a whole, Pro Skater 5 is left to languish at the bottom of the pile, remembered only for its failures. A total wipeout. Number 18. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater – Game Boy Color 2000 while most ports and iterations of the early Tony Hawk games were on a more or less equal footing, the Game Boy Color version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater represented a drastic drop in quality compared to its legendary counterparts. Developed by prolific studio Natsumi, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on the Game Boy Color is a title that proves that the developers didn't know quite how to translate the gameplay of the console version to a handheld device capable of only 2D visuals. Natsumi opted to provide the player with a few different modes, like a half-pipe mode where players perform tricks and accumulate points, and a number of racing modes including one-on-one -on -one races, tournaments, and multiplayer, but none of these offerings were particularly enjoyable. The half-pipe mode was seen as crushingly boring and awkward, with tricks 
looks difficult to pull off thanks to misread button inputs and no incentive to keep playing beyond sating any initial curiosity. The game offers a number of professional skateboarders to choose from, but this choice has little bearing on the halfpipe mode and the smattering of different halfpipe levels to choose from only changes the aesthetic and not the gameplay. In the racing mode, however, your choice of skater has a huge impact on your chances of success with the overly difficult AI ensuring that lower rated skaters would be completely left in the dust by top level borders. Tricks can be performed during these races, but only the most determined players will be able to pull off said tricks while also staying competitive in the race, and the computer skaters are extremely aggressive, knocking into you at the slightest opportunity. Worst of all, though, is the implementation of the tricks, with every single stale fish, indie, or method performed by the player causing a full-screen illustration of the trick to appear, completely shattering the flow of the gameplay. It's easy to look back on this early attempt at a handheld skateboarding game and scoff, but the choice to constantly interrupt the game in this way is truly baffling, and something that, thankfully, doesn't rear its head in the series again. Number 17. Tony Hawk's Motion DS 2008 Released exclusively for the DS and developed by Crete Studios, Tony Hawk's Motion had a special gimmick up its sleeve, the inclusion of a motion pack which was inserted into the DS's Game Boy Advance slot and used as a method of control. That information alone, along with this game's early inclusion in this video, should be enough to let most experienced gamers understand where this is going, but we'll expand upon it nonetheless because there are a few points of interest concerning this somewhat obscure DS oddity. First of all, the game actually features snowboarding as well as skateboarding, giving players the opportunity to wrap up warm, take the wheels off their board, and perform tricks and grinds along snowy courses as well as the usual urban skate parks. The cartridge also came with a second bonus game called Hue Pixel Painter, which again used the motion pack add-on to control a strange, hairy, little ghost-type character as he smears paint behind him, bringing light and colour to a lifeless world, just like Tony. It's all very odd, and whilst it may seem like good value to have two games for the price of one, the fact of the matter is that both titles felt more like a demo than a full experience. Tony Hawk's Motion was severely lacking in content, and what content was there felt awkward and unfinished, with the all-important motion controls proving to be unresponsive. What a surprise. Tony Hawk's Motion is no more than an odd footnote in the series' history, a strange little game twinned with another strange little game and packed in with a strange little peripheral that was basically doomed before it hit the shelves, what with the then upcoming DSi not featuring the Game Boy Advance port. The only motion we can really recommend when it comes to this Tony Hawk's title is the motion of turning away and leaving it exactly where it is on the shelf. <laughs> Alright, I know, that was a bad joke, no need to get emotional about it. Please don't turn off the video. Number 16. Tony Hawk Ride PS3, Wii and Xbox 360 2009 the first game made by the aforementioned Robomodo after Neversoft's departure from the series, Tony Hawk Ride looked to get a piece of Guitar Hero's peripheral-based success by coming packed with a big plastic skateboard controller. The plan was to allow would-be skateboarders to skate in their own homes without having to worry about things like wheels, passers-by, and, you know, actual skateboarding. Hatched by longtime Tony Hawk publishers Activision, the peripheral-based Tony Hawk Ride was marketed as an exciting new direction for the franchise and the breakthrough that the series needed to stay relevant in the ever-changing medium. With the gift of hindsight, it is now seen as a harebrained scheme to take a teetering franchise and lump it with yet another gimmicky peripheral during an era of gaming plagued by unwieldy motion controls and ill-fated attempts to win over the casual gaming audience. Tony Hawk Ride offers various game modes, including slaloms, speed challenges, and trick sessions, and the controller itself uses infrared technology to detect the player's movement and weight distribution on the board. Movements like turning, leaning, and hopping were intended to translate realistically on screen, but to the surprise of very few onlookers, this was not really the case in practice. The gameplay and controls were deemed awkward by reviewers, and the control method required a level of dedication to master that simply wasn't worth it when the game itself was so lackluster and disappointing. The title's average score across all three consoles hovers in the 40s, and Tony Hawk Ride found itself taking up space in retail store stockrooms the world over after potential customers decided that they already had enough barely used oversized gaming accessories cluttering up their cupboards and attics. Tony Hawk Ride was one of the first massive signs of the franchise's transformation from a series that captured the unbridled joy of pure, addictive gameplay to one that frustrated with repeated attempts at unwanted gimmicks and executive meddling. Stop the ride, please. I want to get off. 
Number 15. Tony Hawk Shred, PS3, Wii, and Xbox 360. 2010. It's Tony Hawk Ride, but they added snowboarding. If you were once a cool, young, and active person who is aware of extreme sports slang like I am, then you would have already known this, as one doesn't shred on a skateboard. Shredding is an activity reserved exclusively for snowboarders. And those who need to dispose of sensitive documents securely, but that's far less cool, although still weirdly satisfying. Anyway, Tony Hawk Shred is the immediate sequel to Tony Hawk Ride and came packaged with the exact same peripheral with a different visual design. Aiming to right the wrongs of its predecessor, Tony Hawk Shred Shred packed in some additional content, and the developers put a lot of effort into making this game live up to its perceived promise. The snowboarding was a welcome addition, and kind of made more sense considering you're standing on a wheelless board, and the Birdman himself showing up to offer hints and tips on using the controller gave the game an added sense of authenticity. Tony Hawk Shred was an improvement, but was still way off the mark when it came to providing a compelling and enjoyable skateboarding experience. Though the critical reception was slightly less negative than Tony Hawk Ride, the game's average still languishes in the red, and despite the efforts made by Robomodo to improve the experience, frustrating gameplay and awkward control still ruled the day. The title's sales performance matched its critical reception, with the game only selling 3,000 copies in the US during the week of release. Fans of the Tony Hawk franchise were crestfallen, and as far as mainline console releases go, the series went into a five-year stasis, broken only by the fiasco that was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. It's all a bit depressing, really. But don't worry, it's all uphill from here. Or would that be downhill? Because going downhill is easier, especially on a skateboard. Hmm, I'm not sure whether we should be going up or downhill at this point. Number 14. Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam. PlayStation 2 and Wii. 2006. Alright, downhill it is, with Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam! Developed by Toys for Bob and released across home consoles and handheld platforms, Downhill Jam was meant to complement the release of Tony Hawk's Project 8, which hit the shelves at the same time on next generation systems. Unsurprisingly, the aim of the game in Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam is to skate downhill at irresponsible speeds, racking up points along the way for doing tricks and grinds and beating your fellow skaters to the bottom. It's the only mainline Tony Hawk game to feature a racing mechanic, and the act of violently pushing other racers to the curb is positively encouraged. Honestly, Tony, that's no way to treat a lady. What is this, road rash? Unnecessary violence aside, this racing aspect makes Downhill Jam a unique game in the franchise, and courses based on well-known hilly locations like the streets of San Francisco and the steep roads around Hong Kong definitely add some appeal. Unfortunately, interesting ideas don't always translate to great games, and Downhill Jam has a number of critical hindrances that turn it into a bumpy ride. While finding the optimum route and seeking out shortcuts in the longer races could prove entertaining, the game was just too frustrating and clunky to be enjoyed for any length of time, with awkward controls, unfairly punishing collisions, and janky physics all combining to sour the experience. Another caveat noted by reviewers was that Downhill Jam just didn't feel like a Tony Hawk game, with series veterans used to the exploration aspect expressing their disappointment at the fact that it was all but missing in this iteration. Downhill Jam was seen as more of a racing game than a skateboarding game, with unflattering comparisons drawn to the generally superior SSX series. Despite all this, it's still a shame that this one didn't gain more of a following, because we'd have liked to have seen it spawn its own series. Just imagine the potential follow-ups to Downhill Jam. Downhill Marmalade? Downhill Honey? Downhill Pickle? The possibilities are endless. Number 13. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. Game Boy Color. 2000. Hey, do you remember that Tony Hawk game that's a 2D side-scroller? Well, then you never played Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 for the Game Boy Color, did you? After Natsumi's fumbling of the Game Boy Color port of the first Pro Skater, Activision trusted them enough to allow for another crack at the whip, and this time they went down an entirely different route. The result was a game that's definitely a lot more playable than its handheld predecessor, and entirely unique in the Tony Hawk franchise. The game features two types of side-scrolling environment, a single plane side-scrolling levels similar to run-and-gun shooters like Contra, and street locales, where players are able to move up and down the screen as well, similar to something like Double Dragon. If you're used to those types of games, you might expect your chosen skateboarder to pull out some kind of laser cannon or unleash a flying kick, but this is strictly about the tricks and flips, I'm afraid. Reviewers found that both types of environment had something to offer, but generally preferred the single plane stages, thanks to sluggish movement often making moving up and down the screen in the street-style levels a bit of a flow-breaking chore. 
Each stage has a number of goals that players have to clear to fully complete the game, ranging from scoring a certain amount of points, collecting cash, or hunting down letters to spell out the word skate. Though they all seem fairly straightforward, the level design ensures that certain goals will be devilishly tricky to complete in the time limit, giving players who feel inclined to beat the game plenty to wrestle with. Despite being a marked improvement over Natsumi's first attempt at a Game Boy Color Tony Hawk title, however, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 still didn't do enough to wow the gaming public. Players and reviewers appreciated the range of available tricks and the level of challenge on offer, but the controls didn't even come close to representing the sublime poise and precision of its console-based siblings. It's probably the best skateboarding game on the handheld, but that isn't really saying an awful lot. Still, at least you can skateboard in space. Number 12. Tony Hawk's Proving Ground PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, Wii, and Xbox 360 2007 with its mixed to average review scores, its refusal to tread new ground, and its cover art that looks very similar to all those big budget action game cover arts of the era, Tony Hawk's Proving Ground is something of a poster boy for the unremarkable. It was the last Tony Hawk game developed by Neversoft, but they said goodbye to the series that brought them so much success by releasing a game that was sadly starting to feel a little old. Now, that's not to say Tony Hawk's Proving Ground is a poor skating game. Neversoft knew what they were doing, and even when they weren't pushing the envelope, they were capable of providing a solid skateboarding experience, but compared to the bombastic praise that was levelled at many of Proving Ground's predecessors, Solid seems more than a little underwhelming. The game's single-player mode plays out across nine levels, based in real-life cities along the east coast of America, with players invited to grind the curbs and railings of Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. The main aim across these three famous burgs is to best a returning Eric Sparrow, the jealous turncoat from the Tony Hawk's Underground games. That little monster. In the PS3 and 360 versions of the games, the three cities are all spread out across one large map, but the less powerful consoles offering separate the three areas with loading screens, and this, along with a few other missing features, displeased Wii and PS2 owners. It's also worth noting that it was around this time that EA stuck their gigantic solid gold ore in the genre, with highly rated skateboarding interloper Skate hitting shelves a month before Proving Ground's release. This EA Black Box developed title would provide a new spin on skateboarding games and would go on to spawn a short series that came rather close to knocking the Birdman off his perch. Despite this newfound competition, Tony Hawk's Proving Ground rarely offered anything beyond a solid skating experience and is significant only for marking the point at which longtime developers Neversoft went off to prove themselves on some entirely different ground. Number 11. Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam DS and Game Boy Advance 2006 in a trend that you're going to see crop up at least once or twice more in this list, the handheld version of Downhill Jam was the one that proved to be the most popular with critics, specifically the DS version. It was developed by the studio known as Vicarious Visions, who made quite a name for themselves handling the portable incarnations of numerous Tony Hawk titles. Of course, Vicarious Visions have other games under their belts too, from the Xbox port of Doom 3 to Zebco Fishing for the Game Boy Color, but we're not talking about those games today. Your day may come, Zebco Fishing fans, but it is not this day. With Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam on the DS, Vicarious Visions surprised contemporary gamers with their mastery of Nintendo's handheld, getting the machine to produce some exemplary 3D visuals for the time and crafting an enjoyable, miniature interpretation of the series' trademark pick-up-and-play gameplay. The game once again focused on downhill skateboarding racing and kicks things off in San Francisco, the most famous of all the world's hilly cities and a downboard skater's dream come true. As with the console version of Downhill Jam, many fans and critics were concerned about the game's shift from open-ended trick skating to racing, but the DS version mostly allayed such fears, offering an enjoyable experience in its own right that provides an alternative to the more traditional Tony Hawk games. Some missed the exploration aspect, but it's not as if they couldn't find it elsewhere. The GBA version, however, didn't fare quite as well, but still provided an alternate skateboarding experience and even managed full 3D visuals, though the lack of any texture mapping gives it a certain abstract appeal, shall we say? Still, if you're looking for skateboarding action on the go, you can do worse than the handheld versions of Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam, even if they don't really feel like fully-fledged additions to the Tony Hawk franchise. They're definitely a lot more action-packed than Zebco Fishing, anyway. Again, apologies to any Zebco fans. And Peter, who is also a Zebco Fishing fan. Peter? Number 10. Tony Hawk's American Wasteland GameCube, PC, PS2, Xbox, and Xbox 360 2005 
Tony Hawk's American Werewolf in London was the first game in the series to consist of one big open play area rather than separate selectable skate parks. Kind of. The publishers advertised the game's setting of Los Angeles as one big level, but certain reviewers took exception to that claim, pointing out that long, bland, connecting corridors simply replaced the loading screens, and the map wasn't as big and open as Activision and Neversoft would have had players believe. Another series first that cannot be denied, though, is the addition of bikes that players can commandeer, with freestyle BMX tricks and techniques adding another string to the Tony Hawk bow, the, the Bony Hawk. The game's story mode features the protagonist, a player named Male Skater, moving to Los Angeles to turn over a new leaf, leaving behind a life of delinquency to become a socially upstanding skateboarder. Throughout the course of the single-player campaign, players will be interacting with the local skateboarding crew, proving their skills and collecting wood to help with skate park construction. Noble work indeed. Tony Hawk's American Wasteland was fairly well received among press and franchise fans, and while the game didn't exactly take new strides, many observers appreciated the return to good old-fashioned skateboarding after the more arcadey, destruction-based interlude of the Underground games. The game the game's story mode was also similarly enjoyed, with the ragtag bunch of skateboard-loving misfits versus evil property developers plotline proving agreeable to fans and throwing up a few likeable characters. However, many reviewers noted that American Wasteland did little to evolve the series, and many also noted that the game was far too easy, with incessant hand-holding tutorials throughout. It seems that most skateboard enjoyers, myself included, would rather be set free to explore and discover the world of rails and halfpipes ourselves, left to make our own mistakes and earn our own victories, and to learn to be great on our own terms. That's in the video game world, I must stress. If I ever made the mistake of getting on a skateboard in real life, I know I would definitely want somebody nearby to hold my hand. Preferably both of them. Number 9. Tony Hawk's Project 8 PS2, PS3, PSP, Xbox, and Xbox 360 2006 Tony Hawk's Project 8 is, unsurprisingly, the eighth title in the Tony Hawk video game franchise, but its name is more than just a working title that stuck. The term Project 8 refers to the game's story mode, where Mr. Hawk sees fit to create a skating team consisting of eight of the top skaters in town, and it's the player's job to work their way up the rankings and make it into Tony's elite octet. The next Tony Hawk game to grace the shelves after American Wasteland, the PS3 and 360 versions of the game introduced a new engine, and finally gave the series a real and undisputed seamless open world. Tony Hawk's Project 8 was also the first in the series to introduce the Nail the Trick feature, in which the camera zooms in on the skateboard as time slows, and the player is free to unleash a flurry of neat tricks using the analog sticks. Project 8 is also ideal for those who like to show off in front of a random passerby, as when stylish tricks are performed in front of pedestrians, they will, much like in real life, attain the stoked status, and the player will receive a currency known as stokens, which can be spent on in-game items. The critical reception for Tony Hawk's Project 8 fluctuated across systems, with the old-gen versions dropping below 70%, but the PS3 and 360 versions being being praised for the graphical jump. The new Nail the Trick feature was also well received, but the PS3 version's review average did take a hit thanks to some frame rate woes. Some other issues that came up in reviews included the lack of challenge and the fact that, aside from Nail the Trick, the game felt very similar to its predecessors, with many pundits suggesting that Neversoft might be running out of ideas, with the whole thing becoming somewhat formulaic. Still, this is the only game that I know of that lets you shag your dad's ball. Talk about innovation. That means something completely different in America, right? I certainly hope so, anyway. Number 8. Tony Hawk's American Skateland DS and Game Boy Advance 2005 
The snappily named Tony Hawk's American Skateland was once again created by seasoned handheld developer Vicarious Visions, and with it, the New York-based studio continued to show their skill at getting that signature Tony Hawk gameplay translated into handheld form. We must stress, though, that the position of this game on our list is primarily based on the DS version. The GBA version exists, it's there, it had an isometric viewpoint and pre-rendered backdrops, and it was kind of average. Those who'd adopted Nintendo's dual-screened device, however, were in for a bit of a treat. Tony Hawk's American Skateland for the DS featured many of the same characters, sounds, and locations as its home console counterpart, but with its Jet Set Radio esque cell shaded visuals and its interesting use of the handheld's various features, it proved to be one of the better games on the system, especially so early in its lifespan. Thanks to the DS's button layout, kind of mimicking the original PlayStation controller, American Skateland had an authentic feel for series veterans, and the touchscreen controls meant that Vicarious Visions could add a few extra options to the gameplay. Far from just a place to put an overhead map of the area, the DS's touchscreen was used to unleash special tricks that cause mappable buttons to appear on said screen, ready to be utilized for some cool, stylus-activated moves. Players could also use the touchscreen to make creative designs for the in-game boards, and could even use the DS's mic to record sound clips to be used in the game. But while these inclusions may be seen as gimmicks, the game's Wi-Fi integration was certainly not. In fact, American Skateland was the first non-Nintendo published game to make use of the console's Wi-Fi integration, and allowed skating fans to test their metal against other handheld skaters the world over. It wasn't perfect, and the series was starting to get a bit long in the tooth at this point, but Tony Hawk's American Skateland proved to be one of the best ways to enjoy skateboarding that could fit into your pocket. I mean, it's definitely better than those finger skateboard things anyway. At least I can do tricks in this game. Number 7. Tony Hawk's Proving Ground DS 2007 while the console versions of Tony Hawk's Proving Ground represent Neversoft skating off to pastures new and dropping a decent but unremarkable swan song on their way out of the door, the DS version showcases Vicarious Visions once again coming in clutch, with another handheld title that packed more fun into its tiny cartridge than its console-based brethren stuffed onto a compact disc. With Proving Ground, the developer expanded upon what they'd already offered with Downhill Jam and American in Skateland, replacing the toon-like aesthetic with some more realistic-looking visuals, and upping the challenge a little, offering more practiced players something to sink their teeth into if they wanted to achieve those elusive SICK ratings. It even included a miniature skate park editor, although this couldn't hold a candle to what the console titles had to offer. Not content with just bolstering the single-player experience, though, Vicarious Visions also did a lot of work to the online component for their third bash at a DS Tony Hawk game. While the DS itself was limited in its online capabilities, Tony Hawk's Proving Ground still managed to offer four-player multiplayer, and enabled fans to share their board, wall, and clothing designs with online friends. Like its home console brethren, this version of Tony Hawk's Proving Ground's main weakness is the fact that it exists in a long line of games that do much the same thing, without really adding to the core gameplay enough to make make it stand out. On the DS, however, it was only the third Tony Hawk game after American Skateland and Downhill Jam, and so it stands out as the best of the three, thus taking the crown for being the preeminent skateboarding experience on the popular dual-screen device. And when you consider that the DS is home to classics like SpongeBob Surf and Skate Road Trip, that is some very high praise indeed. Number 6. Tony Hawk's Underground 2 – GameCube, Game Boy Advance, PC, PS2, and Xbox 2004. When Neversoft felt that the Pro Skater series had run its course, they decided to take things underground, and good old-fashioned sports-based skateboarding was replaced with delinquency, vandalism, and general social misconduct, with the Tony Hawk's Underground games really living up to that THUG acronym. 
While this new attitude for the series was welcomed by a youth scene obsessed with Jackass and MTV, Underground 2 especially does feel a little dated by modern standards. But great gameplay never ages, and Tony Hawk's Underground 2 still nails those tried and tested series mechanics. Taking players on a skateboarding journey from New Orleans to Barcelona and from Boston to Berlin, the game's story mode sees the protagonist kidnapped by Tony Hawk and Bam Margera and forced to compete in a worldwide destruction tour, where the Birdman's team take on Bams to earn points by causing havoc across the globe. Team members are eliminated one by one in humiliating fashion, like having a tennis ball launched into their genitals. Oh, what fun. The game featured large maps to explore, and a classic mode was welcomed by series veterans who enjoyed the opportunity to play the timed goal challenges that were the early game's bread and butter. Having said that, most critics were underwhelmed by the minor improvements made to the gameplay compared to Underground 2's predecessors, and were disappointed at the lack of new moves and tricks added to the game's repertoire. Similarly controversial was the visual style, with Neversoft's new cartoony approach to character models unsettling series fans who were used to the more relatively realistic models of the first Underground title. The main reason, though, that Tony Hawk's Underground 2 lags behind its older sibling is its story mode. The gameplay was certainly improved, if only slightly, and while the aesthetic choices were controversial, they weren't a deal-breaker for most. The story mode, however, was almost universally seen as inferior, with Tony, Bam, and the gang's jackass-like antics failing to get players as invested as in the first Underground's tale of betrayal and of skating for the love of skating versus doing it because, oh, those guys on MTV sure are cool, aren't they? Not that we're above watching someone unleash an angry bull into a hotel room or anything, we just don't find it that relatable in the arena of skating video games. Number 5. Tony Hawk's Underground GameCube, Game Boy Advance, PC, PS2, and Xbox 2003 and now for the game that first took the Tony Hawk series underground. Not only did Tony Hawk's Underground feature a more gritty atmosphere and introduce the ability to dismount the skateboard and explore on foot, but it also introduced infamous gaming scumbag Eric Sparrow, a young man who lives on in legend alongside the likes of Heimdall from God of War Ragnarok and the dog from Duck Hunt in the pantheon of video gaming's most insufferable arses. Oh, and you can also drive around in cars. Sometimes. The story mode sees the player-created protagonist attempting to achieve their dream of becoming a professional skateboarder alongside the aforementioned Eric Sparrow, their neighborhood friend. As the story progresses, Eric's jealous and untrustworthy nature is gradually revealed, culminating in an earth-shattering betrayal involving a Russian tank. Yes, seriously. Aside from this epic tale, Tony Hawk's Underground offered an intuitive, well-designed skate park creator some decently realized and graphically adequate cityscapes to grind around in, and continued the series tradition of providing pleasing skateboarding mechanics that were easy to pick up and tough to master. In fact, some observers pointed out that Tony Hawk's Underground served as an ideal starting point for anybody new to skateboarding games, so accessible was the gameplay. The game's extensive soundtrack was also appreciated, with rock icons like KISS lining up alongside punk bands such as Rise Against and hip-hop acts like Jurassic 5 to provide ample accompaniment to all the Benny Hannas and kickflips. Despite the game's universal acclaim, reviewers did find a few nits to pick, and these usually centered on the moments in the game that didn't involve skating. While they provided a bit of novelty and variety, the walking and vehicle sections were seen as unnecessary distractions that controlled poorly, and some found that the addition of a story mode hampered replayability. These slight downsides aren't enough to stop Tony Hawk's Underground from being a legendary title, however, and most players appreciated the addition of a story mode to spice up proceedings, even if it did mean they wanted nothing more than to wrap their skateboard around Eric Sparrow's stupid, traitorous head. 
Number 4. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 GameCube, Game Boy Advance, PC, PS1, PS2, Zodiac, and Xbox 2002 As we enter into the top 4 of our list, we also enter into hallowed territory, as the original Pro Skater games are held in extremely high esteem by gamers and reviewers of the era, and occupy grand pedestals in the halls of gaming history. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 continued the legacy of the first three games, offering the largest levels yet seen in the series, and further securing Neversoft's place at the top of the pile, in an era that saw more and more pretenders emerging, looking for a piece of the skateboarding video game pie. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 was also the progenitor of the story modes that would come to define later games in the series. While it didn't have a story mode per se, it did move away from individual timed challenges, and instead allowed the player to explore the levels freely as they chased their goals, picking up tasks from characters that were dotted around the place. While many appreciated this change, others preferred the old school mechanics, but the fact that both approaches offered a free skating mode meant that no one was too offended either way. In fact, the only real complaint leveled at Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 was that the graphics graphics had barely advanced over the third game, so it's sitting here at number 4 thanks to a lack of moving things forward. The GBA version also received heavy plaudits for its clever design and enjoyable challenges, just missing out on GameSpot's Game of the Year 2002 award to Metroid Fusion, no less. No shame in earning the runner-up medal there. Oh, and lastly, since we're on the subject of handhelds, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 has a particular claim to fame that no other game in the Tony Hawk series can duplicate. It was released on the Zodiac, a mobile entertainment system manufactured by Californian company Tapwave in 2003. What do you mean you haven't heard of it? I carry my Tapwave Zodiac around with me all the time. What Tapwave star sign are you? Number 3. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Dreamcast, PS1, N64, and Engage 1999. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, also known as Tony Hawk's Skateboarding in certain regions, was the game that started it all. By mixing skateboarding with cutting-edge 3D graphics, an alternative punk and ska soundtrack, expertly crafted and accessible gameplay, and a generous dose of attitude, Neversoft captured lightning in a bottle. Websites and gaming periodicals hailed the game as a revelation, a skill-based, authentic-feeling skateboarding game that was easy to pick up and endlessly satisfying to master. It wasn't the first skateboarding game ever, it wasn't even the first skateboarding game on the PS1, as Street Border, or Street Skater depending on your region, was able to beat it to the punch in Japan. It is the first one to set the gaming world ablaze though, and deservedly so. The goal was to perform combinations of tricks in order to increase a score and complete objectives. Stringing multiple tricks of different types together will see the points go racing up, and this will also fill a special gauge which can be used to perform special tricks for even more points. If you keep repeating the same old tricks over and over, you'll accumulate points more slowly, and if you get carried away and fall off your board, any points accumulated from the current string of tricks will be lost. We're assuming by this point in the list you understand all of this, but you know, this was the first game to do it, so it seems a good place to mention it, you know? This risk versus reward gameplay formed the basis of the entire series, and made for a game that was addictive and challenging, yet simple enough that anyone could have a great time. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater also included a number of local multiplayer modes, including Graffiti, where players accumulate points to claim sections of the levels, Trick Attack, where the players chain tricks together to hit the highest scores, and Horse, which has absolutely nothing to do with horses. Reviewers adored the game, praising everything from the physics to the soundtrack to the horses. No, sorry, there weren't any horses. And the only real negative comments came thanks to the slight performance hit suffered by the N64 version. This fortunately didn't stop it from achieving an average score in the 90s, and even the N-Gage version delighted pundits with its gameplay and visuals, and was seen as THE game to own on Nokia's handheld. Probably the only one. I mean, if even the N-Gage version is lauded, then this truly must be one of the all-time greats. 
Number 2. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, GameCube, PC, PS1, PS2, N64, and Xbox 2001 Considered one of the greatest games of all time, the third entry into the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater franchise has some interesting claims to fame, beyond just being an absolute dream to play. Not only was it the last official release for the Nintendo 64, which had ceased production a few months earlier, but Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 was also one of the launch games for Nintendo's GameCube, thus representing the cycle of death and rebirth for the Japanese giant. It also stands as the joint high rated game on the PlayStation 2 alongside Grand Theft Auto 3, and it was the first PS2 release that supported online play. While being significant for all of these reasons and more, the main thing you need to remember about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 is that it was, and still is, a bloody great game. Building on what had come before, Pro Skater 3 further tightens and refines the gameplay found in its predecessors, and pleased combo-hungry players with the addition of the Revert trick, which provided the ability to keep combos going after landing in a quarter pipe and pushed the skill ceiling even higher. This, along with online play, meant that Pro Skater 3 was ideal for skilled players dying to test their digital skateboarding prowess against like-minded individuals across the globe. But the game still retained that all-important accessibility, ensuring that novices and casual players would have just as much fun. The portable versions were about as well regarded as the home console games, with Vicarious Visions doing an outstanding job on the GBA version, and a development studio known as Hot Gen, who worked on the infamously rubbish Batman Dark Tomorrow, managing to whip up what is probably the best Tony Hawk game on the Game Boy Color. I mean, it's still not great, but you know, we'll take it. Xbox owners were the real privileged ones though, with the version for Microsoft's console having a superior frame rate and offering an exclusive level known as the Oil Rig. PS1 and N64 users had to make do with a game that used the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 engine, but, you know, if you've been paying attention to where we are in the list and which game hasn't been mentioned yet, you will know that that isn't exactly a bad thing. Let's get to that now, shall we? Ben? Number 1. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 Dreamcast, Game Boy Advance, PC, PlayStation 1, and Nintendo 64 2000 Alright, this is it. This is the one that, as far as we've seen, ignites the biggest fires of skateboarding passion in the hearts of skateboard-loving gamers, and creates the warmest and most blissful feelings of gaming nostalgia. It's also the game that's sitting right up there at number 2 in Metacritic's all-time video game rankings, sharing its metascore with Grand Theft Auto 4, Soul Calibur, and Super Mario Galaxy 2, with only The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time considered a better game according to the accumulation and aggregation of numerical critical scores. Whether you agree with all that stuff or not, you can't help but admit that we're talking about the very pinnacle of gaming here, the tippy top of what the medium has to offer. Using the same engine as its predecessor, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 makes numerous improvements that elevated the game in the eyes of almost everyone who played it, and ensured it offered exactly what everyone was expecting from a sequel to a top-rated game. Not only did Neversoft improve the graphics and license even more appropriate music, but they also worked hard on that all-important gameplay. The addition of manuals that allow numerous tricks to be chained together and require directional inputs to keep your skateboarder balanced opened up a whole new level of depth to the gameplay, and the distribution of cash rewards which can be spent on upgrading your moves or unlocking new equipment and playable skaters gave players that extra motivation to perfect their game. With numerous multiplayer modes, a skate park creator, and plenty to unlock, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 featured enough content to keep fans occupied for years, or at least until the equally stellar third game in the series came out in 2001. Fans of extreme sports games really had it so good back then. Lack of current skateboarding games aside, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 stands as one of the paragons of the sports genre and of gaming as a whole. With its great graphics for the time, its world-class controls, and the overall quality and era-appropriate charm, Pro Skater 2 will forever live in the hearts of a whole generation of kick-flipping, rail-grinding, punk-listening gamers, and does the most to cement 
cement the Birdman status as a video gaming legend. And that's without even mentioning yet another expertly handled GBA port by Vicarious Visions. Truly, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is the raddest of the rad. Now, if you'll excuse us, all this Tony Hawk talk has made us want to dig our old board out of the shed and grind some rails in the local park for a bit. I hope that helmet still fits. 